So we've been offering professional welding and fabrication classes here at the Fabrication Series shop in Las Vegas, Nevada in a one-on-one -on -one type of fashion or even in groups. Been doing it for the past couple years now. And in that time, I've noticed a very common trend, if you will, with the people that have never picked up a TIG torch in their entire life. A very, very common list of things that people do when they have zero experience. Now this is for you guys. Now if you have some experience already or you're a professional, it might not be the video that you're looking for. But if you've never picked up a torch before or you're trying to teach yourself and all the rest of that good stuff, I got 10 things right here that most people make and might help you avoid you know, some of that confusion, that frustration and everything else like that when you're trying to teach yourself. Now, nothing will ever really replace that one-on-one -on -one instruction or that face-to-face -face kind of interaction you're going to get from somebody teaching you how to do it, but this might help you get started or at least get in the right direction a little bit quicker. Now, if you want more information about taking a class, here's your video card right up there. Make sure you click on that, book your seat, show up, we take care of the rest. It's that easy. So here we go. The top 10 mistakes new welders make when they first start TIG welding. Number one, getting wrapped up. Now I see this happening constantly. What it basically boils down to is whoever is sitting in the seat or the first time that they're doing this, they're basically looking at whoever was on, you know, Instagram or Facebook, you know, watching a video on YouTube or anything like that. They basically see whoever the welder is sitting there wrapped up in their lead, right? They're basically making it comfortable for themselves. But the person usually in that video is kind of, uh, let's just say, experienced, right? They know where their lead is comfortable. They know how they like it and all the rest of that good stuff. So if you've never done this before, it's it's really hard to, you know, try to manage your torch or manage your lead. Now they do get heavy and everything like that, and sometimes it's nice to have it loosely hanging on something. But the way I see a lot of people doing this is they start wrapping this thing all around themselves in every which way, shape, or form, and it really gets kind of oh, I don't know, complicated to try and, uh, you know, manage the lead. So in the beginning here, try not to wrap this thing all over you. Instead, the best place to really put your lead when you're first starting out welding is up through the center of your legs and on the inside of your torch forearm. This basically helps prevent it from snagging or stretching the lead. Since your arm is in the position to actually pull it, it can easily be pulled away or uh, pulled away from a snag or anything like that. It just, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to move it along if it gets held up. Now this does add just a little bit of weight to it, but one little trick is you can take a little bit of the slack and just put it in your lap. Number two, floating. Now floating is elevating your arms, your upper body, and all the rest of that to aim for a spot that's only a quarter inch or maybe a couple millimeters wide. It's extremely difficult. It puts a lot of pressure and a lot of tension on your core, your upper body, your shoulders, your arms, your everything. And what happens is your brain is now focused on steadying your body more and trying to aim and do all this stuff than it is on the actual weld, which you need a lot of concentration for. Now if you float or anything like that, you're going to pretty much be, you know, aiming for a failure right off the get-go. So instead, make sure that you're nice and relaxed. Your arms should be loose. Your whole body should be loose. Now, we're not saying slouch all the time, which I've made people do, but make sure that you don't have, if you've ever been in my class, the chicken wing going on. Make sure that your, your arms are, and your hands are just kind of nicely rested, right? Just, just can stream along and just glide along that weld there. If you've got shakiness or if you have... Uh, a blotchiness in your in your feeding action or anything like that you're you're pretty much there's there's tension somewhere on your body so you've got to relax now we're not always going to get a perfect weld position like we are on a flat surface or on a table or anything like that but at the same time if you master this or if you get comfortable in the beginning you'll be able to go out of position much easier than if uh, than if you didn't so it's always best to practice get yourself comfortable get relaxed don't float and no chicken wings Number three, a hop along. This is the most difficult habit for me to break when it comes to people with MIG welding experience because they usually run in patterns. But essentially, the hop along is a pattern or a movement, if you will, that most newbie TIG welders make. Every MIG welder does this, but a lot of TIG welders can't really get the correlation between moving the torch hand at one rate and feeding the rod with the other rate or at another rate. So a lot of people see this as kind of like, uh, I don't know, rubbing your stomach and patting your head at the exact same time, which is very difficult to do. 
But what a lot of people end up doing is getting into this pattern where the feeding hand pretty much takes over like the torch hand and it just literally goes elevate to big puddle, then to little puddle, then big puddle, then little puddle. It goes up, down, and it just kind of hops along like a cute little pony. This is something you have to train yourself to break. The torch hand needs to be nice and steady, smooth flowing, constant height. Don't worry about backstepping. Don't worry about stacking dimes. Don't worry about elevation or anything like that. In the beginning, when you're focusing on the mechanics, get the rod hand feeding in out the way it's supposed to and keep the torch hand moving nice and steady, smooth, neat, and flowing. Number four, being too analytical. There, there's some of my crappy weld. Now, I'm quite sure that this is going to get misconstrued somehow or somebody's going to, you know, take offense to it or, you know, throw a fit or anything like that and start a comments hate thread or whatever against, uh, you know, TFS here. But, you know what, I got to shoot it to you straight. If you've never welded before, you don't know what you're doing. It's really that simple. So if you don't know what you're doing, you can't analyze it. Being too analytical about your welds when you don't even know how to weld is, I don't know, it's worthless. There's no reason to do it. Now, there's some obvious things that you can focus on, right? If you know that you took the tungsten for a swim, well, you know that it's going to weld dirty. So you got to take it out and you got to resharpen, put a fresh one in there and go at it again, right? The same thing happens is if you look at your tungsten and you say, oh, wow, that's a big old fat Q-tip on there or a mushroom tip or anything like that. And you know that there's a bunch of junk all over your weld and stuff like that. It's obvious that you took the tungsten for a swim or you did a fashion, good old fashioned tip and dip. You know how to get past that part. That's not being analytical, that's being observant. But trying to figure out how to make your weld better when you don't even know how to make a weld, you can't do it. So instead of being too analytical or trying to correct what you don't know how to correct, instead focus on the mechanics of the weld. You got to have a puddle, you got to have the correct torch height, you got to get the rod in, out, hello, goodbye, you got to get moving on that thing, right? So focus on the mechanics of it. Now being too analytical also runs in line with something that we call pedestaling. What that basically means is that you have got all of that research and you got all of that knowledge and all of this like information about how to weld and you feel so good about it that you think that your first welds, which you've never done, are going to score the top points on all of the social media outlets and get you some seriously awesome cred. Well, there's nothing wrong with doing all of your homework. There's nothing wrong with being confident in what you do, but don't get too confident or too cocky or put it too high up on that pedestal when you've never done it. So the first welds that you're probably going to lay down are most likely going to look like this. Maybe better, maybe worse, but at the same time, don't get your hopes up too high. Just focus on getting to that point. Remember that the people that are being shared on all the social media outlets and stuff like that and getting all the top points and the most likes and all the rest of that good shout out action are the people that do this daily. The people that have been doing this for years and years and years. You have to get to that point. So don't be expecting to land a top spot for the day on all those social media outlets. Remember that you gotta practice. Remember that this takes time. Don't get your hopes up too high, all right? Number six and seven, predicting and rushing. Now this is actually relatively difficult to explain, so let's take a look at this weld. I'm not focusing on what's going to happen until it happens. There is no such thing as predicting where that weld is going to go. If your brain is predicting what's going to happen about 10 dabs from now, as opposed to seeing what's in front of you and working with what's in front of you, it's going to most likely happen. So focus or concentrate more on what's actually happening in front of you. Everything is reactive, not predictive. We don't predict where the weld is going to go and we don't work with anything that hasn't happened yet. So only focus on what's in front of you. Don't predict anything that hasn't or won't happen. Just work with what's in front of you. But that also works at the exact same time with rushing. Now a lot of people will pick up the filler rod or the torch for the first time, smash on the pedal, jam a whole bunch of filler rod in there and try to get going. Nine times out of ten it turns into a big old friggin fat q-tip on the end of that tungsten or a mushroom tip if it's like steel or stainless or something like that. It's not going to work. You can't get into a rush. So like basics here, if you don't have a puddle, you can't weld it. Quite seriously, only look and work with what's in front of you. Don't get into a rush. Don't predict something that hasn't happened. Number eight. Thinking only X and Y. 
Now, thinking only X and Y is literally like saying only thinking two-dimensionally. Now, this is not like some Marty McFly stuff where you got to think fourth-dimensional or whatever the case is, but consider it this way. A lot of people, when they sit down and they square up with their piece of metal, they literally square it up, and they think that they can pretty much only weld left to right. Some people will naturally grab it, and they'll say that they have to move from far away too close. And you know what? It works for a lot of people, but consider different ways. If where you're sitting at right here is not comfortable, if you can't get a nice, smooth, flowing weld out of it, if it doesn't seem right, then it's probably not right. So think of a different method to use. You can do things like welding off the edge of the table, maybe welding on the corner of the table, or even changing your grip to be kind of, I don't know, almost diagonal about it. There's different ways that you can weld in order to achieve a good weld and become comfortable doing it. Now again, we're not always going to get this, you know, this perfect opportunity or, or this, you know, great layout in front of us, but again, we're practicing, we're learning, this is what we're doing, so make it the best. Get friggin' comfortable and think of other ways to do it, not just this way or this way or anything like that. Number nine, extreme angle, height, and ramping. Now this is one of the best visual representations I can offer, and you can do this on your own. Now if you take a flashlight and point it at the floor, the closer you get to the floor, the smaller the light area is. If you lift it up, the larger the light area is. If you tilt it on its side, it projects the light area forward across the floor. Now the exact same thing happens when you turn or lift or move a TIG torch in a different direction. At the end of the TIG torch, you will often see a little cone. That cone essentially becomes the size of the puddle. So if your torch is low, you have a very small, tight, and very controlled puddle. If your torch is high, you have a very wide, loose, and uncontrollable puddle. The same thing happens if you have an extreme angle. The puddle projects forward. Now when it gets to this point of being too big or uncontrollable, that's when you start having a whole lot of problems. And those problems wouldn't be there if you were able to monitor your torch height. Now one thing that a lot of people do is they'll start out very conscious of their torch height, and by the time they get to the end, it becomes extremely high when the piece is already heated up. And that condition is called ramping. That pretty much means it's going to go south immediately. So you got to make sure that your torch height stays consistent the entire way through. No extreme height, no extreme angle, no ramping. Number 10, welding in the wrong direction. How do you weld in the wrong direction? Well, some people might be asking that right now. Here's the answer. I see a lot of people doing this. If they're daisy fresh, never picked up a torch in their life, or they're just getting into it right now. And you can actually see it sometimes in people's welds uh, when you see them like post up or whatever saying, hey, can I get some advice? Here's the deal. The correct direction is in the direction of the filler rod. Now we're excluding the uh, the side feeding or the you know the uh, diagonal feeding or even you know the top feeding like this, which a lot of people do. We're excluding that. You haven't gotten there yet. You got to get to that point first. So the correct direction is in the direction of the filler rod. So if you're right-handed, you're going to be going right to left. If you're left-handed, you're going to be going left to right. That's the correct direction in the direction of the filler rod. So one more just before we get out of here is a little bit of a bonus. I wasn't sure if I was going to put this in or not, but you know what? Hey, let's do it. If you can't see it, you can't weld it. So make sure that wherever you're looking at it, you're actually able to see it. And just in case you didn't know, you're supposed to be staring at the puddle, not the tungsten, not the rod, not the area around it. You're supposed to be staring at the puddle. And if you can't see it, you can't weld it. Very simple. So I really hope that this list helps you out and actually helps you get going and maybe get through some of those hurdles just a little bit faster. Now, if you need to get in touch with us, you can always hit us up on the fabricationseries.com website, Instagram at the.fabricator, or facebook.com slash thefabricatorseries. I want to thank you guys for watching. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the Fabrication Series YouTube channel for more really awesome content, and I will see you guys on the next episode.